Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon to one and all. Welcome students from St. Catharines, St. Christopher's faculty and staff, parents, friends, community members. We are delighted to have you here at St. Christopher's. Uh, we believe this may be a historic moment. I've been asking around the last week or so when the last time was that a sitting mayor of the city of Richmond had visited St. Christopher's and no one has been able to answer that question. So we think uh, Mayor Stoney, we may be making history here, so thank you uh, for being on our campus, Mayor, and Mr. Gordon from the Office of Community Wealth Building. We're honored by your presence as well. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Shekelhoff, but before I do, I just want to make a statement that I think is timely uh, this time of year, January, close to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, timely as we approach Black History Month, but frankly, it's timely 12 months out of the year, 365 days a year, and that is here at St. Christopher's and St. Catharines, we care passionately about being institutions of the city of Richmond and for the city of Richmond. We care deeply about being partners and engaged in the broader community, and it's something that has been important to us, uh, not just recently, but we think for decades. And it doesn't mean we've done it perfectly, it doesn't mean there's not room for improvement, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited with the relationship we have with the mayor and his team and our city council because we are just committed and excited to be better citizens, to be better servants of this greater region and the city in particular and our minds and our hearts are open to ways we can do that even better. So thank you for listening uh, today and look forward to a great dialogue. I'll turn things over to Dr. Shekelhoff. Mr. Lecky said it very well when he talked about just the gift of being able to come together. What a gift that is to have both of our schools together, but now to take some time to dig deep and figure out as we talk about our community beyond our own walls and what we do in our own city, what we can do to be better citizens, to use all that compassion that we have and we display every day. So at this time, I introduce Julia Morella, who will talk a little bit and tell us more about our next guest. Good afternoon. <laughs> a native of Richmond, Mr. Reggie Gordon understood the importance of serving his community from a young age. While a student at Thomas Jefferson High School, Mr. Gordon, who was the president of the school's Red Cross Club, pursued his passion to eventually serve the Red Cross National Committee on Youth Involvement. After receiving his undergraduate degree in public policy from Duke University, Mr. Gordon went on to earn his Juris Doctorate from Howard University School of Law. Beginning his professional career as an attorney for Central Virginia Legal Aid in Emporia, Virginia, and then as in-house counsel for the National Red Cross in Washington, D.C., Mr. Gordon would eventually find his way back to the Richmond area in 1997, first working as a fund developer in the United Way of Greater Richmond and Petersburg, and then as the first executive director of Homeward, the coordinating organization for homeless services in the Richmond region. After seven years with Homeward, Mr. Gordon became the executive director of William Byrd Community House, a multi-service poverty prevention agency. In 2007, Mr. Gordon reconnected with the Red Cross, becoming the chief executive officer of the Greater Richmond Chapter. Just last year, Mr. Gordon stepped down from his role at the Red Cross to become the director of the Richmond Office of Community Wealth Building. Mr. Gordon's commitment to, this, to serving this community is long-standing and deep. It is a great pleasure to welcome him here today. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for allowing us to share this time with you this afternoon. And um, I'm proud to be on the stage here with my boss, the mayor. So I'm, I'm the warm-up act for the mayor today. So I'm going to amplify what you just heard about my life because I know you all have been talking about personal stories. So I'm going to close what I'm about to say with what's going on now, but I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning, meaning high school, just to put it in context for you all. A long time ago, I would have been sitting out there. So I grew up in Richmond. I went to Albert Hill Middle School, Benford Middle School, and went to Thomas Jefferson High School. While at Thomas Jefferson High School, I got involved with service clubs. 
I was not a gifted athlete. You'll hear that the mayor was a gifted athlete. And so as a result, I sort of moved toward the service clubs. I was in the Key Club and actually in the Red Cross. Uh, became a leader in the Red Cross for my school and then the citywide Red Cross president. And this was back in the 70s and little trivia. The Red Cross had an annual convention. Uh, this was in 1977 and they were looking for a youth speaker for their annual convention. So they put out a call throughout the United States to find a young person that could speak to the adults that were uh, working in the Red Cross as volunteers and staff to inspire them to listen to the young people. So all over the country, those of us who competed for that sent in our cassette tapes. Anybody know what a cassette tape is? No, okay. A cassette tape with our speech. Would you believe it that I won? So I, at 17 years old, was taken, flown to Miami Beach, Florida, and I gave a speech to 5,000 adults in the Red Cross saying, please have faith in the kids of today because we're your future leaders. You know, when I look back on that moment, I got a standing ovation and I was like, wow, this is, I wasn't nervous, I guess because there were so many people I couldn't even see faces. When I came back home, I said, you know, it sort of validated the, the thought that maybe as a young person I can make a difference in the world. After high school, went to college, and as you heard, I went to Duke and I majored in public policy. When I was about to graduate, my guidance counselor said, in order to be marketable as a public policy person, you need a law degree. So that's why I went to Howard University for law school. Once I got to law school, things went well and I diverted and became a lawyer. Well, did that for a while, but there was something still, I was in DC, you know, had a great job, I was, my office was near the White House, the Red Cross headquarters is called the Marble Palace, it's on uh, 17th Street in DC, and I was young and I thought, this is it, I've, I've, I've made it, this is what I wanted in life. But after I was there for a while, I realized there must be something else because I wasn't feeling completely fulfilled and I began to think about service. So I actually resigned from that job. People thought I lost my mind because I had reached that pinnacle of success, right? I resigned my job and came back home to Richmond because I missed Richmond. And I started doing informational interviews with nonprofits saying, I want to be a part of you. And the nonprofit community at first did not respond really well to that because they said, you're a lawyer. What could a lawyer possibly do to help the nonprofit community? And so, so I had to really think about what transferable skills did I have? What did I, what I learn about leadership and, and trying to bring people together in negotiation? So eventually, after a couple of months, I was able to get a job working with United Way, which led to a job with Homeward. Homeward was, and still is, the systems integrator for homeless services. So that required me talking to lots of organizations and lots of nonprofits and lots of ministries and, and governmental agencies to see how they could align themselves better to have better outcomes to solve homelessness in Richmond. I love that job. Um, did that for like seven years, and during that process I learned the importance of the voice of the people. We had lots of meetings, and during those meetings, we, were, we had people in the nonprofit community, government community, and people who were homeless around the same table. And we asked questions about what do you think challenges that you see. And I'll never forget one special meeting when we were discussing food in Richmond. And there were churches that were trying to decide when to add another lunch program. And the homeless guy raised his hand and said, may I speak? And we all turned and he went, please do not add another lunch program. We have plenty of food in Richmond year round. In fact, we have breakfast. I could get breakfast, three lunches and dinner. You all aren't talking to each other. And as a result, many of us, we use our money for drugs and alcohol because food's taken care of by you. It would be more prudent if you 
started a breakfast program for those of us who go to work prior to 6 a.m. A hush fell over the room and people listened. So the church that was gonna do a lunch program shifted and did a breakfast program. So back then, this was back in the early 2000s, we actually solved the issue of food for the homeless in Richmond. But the only reason we knew that is because the person was in the room that was the expert that lived that day in, day out. So just at another time, I, will, I don't give money to people who, have, who hold up a sign that said, I'm hungry, I need food. Because I know it's so much more to the story because food is really addressed pretty well in Richmond. And I'll get to that point again in a moment. So I did, I did Homeward, then I went to William Byrd Community House, which is a prevention organization because I realized many people need pathways out of poverty. Did that, went back to the Red Cross for nine years locally as the leader, but then I got an opportunity to work for the city. So this job that I have now, my ultimate goal is to follow the vision of our mayor and that vision includes getting as many people as we can to a level of financial freedom and self-sufficiency. That means solving poverty. And the good news is I've done something similar in the past with those homeward years. It involves bringing people together from the nonprofit community, the academic community, young people, people who aren't so young, people from ministries, people from government agencies, people who are living the experience of not having enough resources have them all in the space together to say what systems, what structures need to shift so that we can find pathways out of poverty. One thing I know for sure, which I, if there's nothing else that you remember today, is Richmond is leading this effort nationally. We're the only city in the country that has an office of community welfare. And part of that requires community engagement. And part of that community engagement means we all need to shift from thinking about charity to thinking about self-sufficiency. We will probably, you'll probably hear more and more over these next few months about moving away from turkey and toys to how do we build bridges of relationships with people so that they can have networks that will help them to thrive and survive. It goes back to that understanding I had years ago about every, all of us want the same things in life, and we've often categorized ourselves as the haves and the have-nots. But in Richmond, it's all of us working together. We can get this done. We have 40 to 50,000 people who are now in poverty or struggling. We know each year we'll find lots of avenues to get adults and the children to a different level of stability. It's exciting, it's hopeful, it's optimistic, but it's time. So I appreciate all the energy, all the ideas coming from you all too, because we're creating a future Richmond that we hope will be a place where you want to live and work, but also make this a better Richmond for all the kids in Richmond, that they can find pathways to be successful leaders. So thank you, thank you very much. Raised in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia, Mr. LeVar M. Sony has dedicated his life to public service and in particular to making the Richmond area an inclusive and desirable place for all to live. As the first in his family to earn a high school diploma, Mayor Stoney went on to graduate from JAMU before moving to Richmond and beginning his career in public services. Over the past 10 years, Mayor Stoney has served the Commonwealth in notable ways. As the first African-American Secretary of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Mayor Stoney was the driving force that helped Virginia restore more civil and voting rights than any other state in the country. Mayor Stoney has also served as the Executive Director of the Democratic Party of Virginia, as well as the Deputy Campaign Manager for Governor McAuliffe's successful gubernatorial campaign. He currently serves on a number of civic and community boards including the VCU Massey Cancer Center Advisory Board, GRASP, a college access organization, Next Up, an after-school program network, and Venture Richmond. Since taking office on December 31st, 2016, notably as the youngest mayor ever elected, Mayor Stoney has championed many initiatives this past year. 
including a record-breaking investment in Richmond's public school students, launching RVA Green 2050, doubling support for the Office of Community Wealth Building, and introducing retention raises for the public safety personnel, including our police officers and firefighters. Mayor Stoney has had a busy year. Fulfilling a vow that he made last year, Mayor Stoney has visited every school and city agency. We are so fortunate that he has made the time to be with us today. Would everyone please join me in welcoming Mayor LeVar Stoney. Well, good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? Good afternoon. Ah, there we go. There we go. I want to first begin by thanking Mr. Levy and uh, Dr. Shapoval for allowing me to. Yes, that's a tough one. I had to write it down. <laughs> uh, for allowing me to have an opportunity to speak to the young men and women of St. Christopher's and St. Catharines. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, similar to uh, Reggie. Uh, Mr. Gordon here, I, um, I pinch myself every single day. I can't believe it's been a year since I've actually took the oath of office to serve as the mayor of what I believe is the greatest city, not only in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but the greatest city in, in the United States of America. Uh, because I look back and 36 years ago, or even later than that, uh, earlier than that, I probably would not I, I pinch myself because I can't believe that a kid who grew up uh, to parents who were, uh, who were kids themselves, my mother was 16, my father was 19 when I was born. I had the great fortune of being raised by my grandmother, a woman who was born and reared in segregated South Carolina and uh, in the 20s and 30s and poured her life into mine um, when I was born. And I lived on, uh, we went to school in a great place, but when others around you have and you don't have, you see it and sometimes you can internalize that. I grew up on a free and reduced lunch from elementary school, middle school, and high school. Uh, but the one thing that drove me every single day is my dad told me and my brother that we can do anything we put our minds to. And that when I stepped into that classroom, no matter those who are sitting around me, that I can compete with them at any level. And that drove me to be the first of my family to graduate from high school, the first of my family to go to college, and the first of my family to graduate from college. I have always been, I guess you could say, intrigued and interested in public service. Uh, I was, a, I considered myself at the time a student government nerd. I served as student body president when I was in elementary school, middle school, high school, and in college. I just felt that leadership matters, and if you want to see change in the world, you have to get off the sidelines and jump into the arena and make it happen. When I went to James Madison, unlike some of my friends who still talk about this today, I knew what I wanted to do from day one. I wanted to get involved in political science and government. I wanted to get out there and see how it all worked. But most of all, I wanted to ensure that voices that normally are not heard are at the table. Because I firmly believe if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. And so, <laughs> I got involved in student government. I got involved in working behind the scenes in democratic politics, worked myself up. Uh, ran the Democratic Party of Virginia. And then when I became Secretary of the Commonwealth, as was mentioned in the bio, I realized that you can still make impactful change through government. My father was a former felon who lost his right to vote. He did gain that back because of laws that were not from Virginia, but of New York. And when I had an opportunity and a seat at the table, I wanted others to actually get their right, their civil rights back as well. And I look back at what happened yesterday when the governor was uh, unveiled his portrait 
that will be hanging in the state capitol from now on to, you know, for the next hundred years. And part of that portrait is what we worked on in restoration of civil rights. That's something I can always grab my grandchildren and say, that's something we did together. I ran for mayor because of the same exact reasons, because I wanted to make sure that voices were at the table and I wanted to make an impact. And from day one, I've been focused on breaking down those institutional barriers, some of those injustices being uh, of, of the racist sort, uh, to ensure that every person in this great city has an opportunity to succeed. That no matter who you are, what color your skin may be, who you love, who you choose to worship, that you can live out your God-given talents right here in the great city of Richmond. That is my vision of One Richmond. One Richmond is about everyone working together to create an equality of opportunity that makes Richmond a better place for everyone who lives here. I believe the residents of this city and especially our students are loaded with talent, but not everyone necessarily loaded with opportunity. And that's what this is about. It's about opportunity. In the city, we must recognize that we are only as great as our weakest neighborhood. So how do we get there? What does one Richmond look like 20, 30 years from now? What can we do and what can you do to make a difference in this city? in this community? The short answer is a lot, together. First, we need to acknowledge a universal, universal aspiration and the cold, hard truth. I think it's safe to say that we all share the same desire for a high quality of life in Richmond. Safe neighborhoods, good schools, and a fair shot at making the most of our God-given talents. But we must also acknowledge that the challenges faced by the poor in our city reflect decades of institutional racism and discrimination that have disenfranchised a large segment of our population. The vestiges of Jim Crow still exist in Richmond, and the underfunding of public schools and the neglected infrastructure in public housing, which isolates and warehouses the poor of this city. I believe these two things have, been, have done more to hold the flesh and blood of our city back than any bronze and granite Confederate monument in Richmond. I say this with full knowledge that I'm speaking to students of a school that not too long ago divided its students into literary societies named after Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. So our efforts to achieve and sustain fairness and social justice requires us all to accept the responsibility and the challenge of unshackling our at-risk communities and the next generation from the bondage and trauma of generational poverty. One in four residents, as Reggie said earlier, lives, one in four of our residents live in poverty in Richmond, 25 percent. Forty percent of our children in this city live in poverty. In public housing, where more than 10,000 of our residents live, the poverty rate is nearly 60%. Students breaking this cycle of despair is the moral challenge of our time. We can do it, and we must do it. First, government has an opportunity, has an important leadership role to play in leveraging relationships and partnerships and resources with those who have to lift up those who have not. I know I know firsthand the transformative difference that government can make in one's life. As you heard about, I grew up on free and reduced lunch. My grandmother got a social security check every single month, and that's how we lived, $1,200 a month every month. The majority of that going to the rent, and what was left over went to the food. And I realized that in this role, that government cannot do it alone. We need partners. We need doers. We need people who want to step outside their bubbles and their comfort zones and be civic-minded, not simply because there's something in it for them, but because there's a benefit to all of us. 
Over the last year in the city, we have had the opportunity to see these kind of collaborations and partnerships at work in a way that have had direct impact on young people. The First Lady of Virginia, Dorothy McAuliffe, and her program, No Child Hungry, last year provided 10 million more meals statewide to hungry kids like the kids here in Richmond and elsewhere than it did three years ago. Earlier this year, we partnered with Sprint to provide 5,000 tablets and internet access to incoming public high school freshmen for the next four years. And working with two nonprofits, we forged a partnership that will provide free vision screens to 20,000 public school students and free eyeglasses to any child that needs them here in Richmond. The story that sticks with me in my first year of office is when I was at Red Elementary School and a mother came to me and thanked me for the partnership that we had created for the eyeglasses and the vision screens. And she said to me that I would not have known or discovered that my child was blind in one eye and he's eight years old. That day he left school with a pair of eyeglasses. We learned that roughly one in four of our children need those glasses. And now they'll have those glasses and be able, if you can't see, you can't read, and if you can't read, you can't succeed. That's just the bottom line. We also virtually doubled our output in the Office of the Community Wealth Building, which allowed us to provide holistic workforce development services to more than 1,700 residents. Our goal is to be lifting 1,000 residents out of poverty by the end of my first term here in office. And also when we use the tools of economic development as well, we not only said we want to redevelop a neighborhood downtown, but we also said that the, the development must have middle income, low income housing for all residents here who can live in the city of Richmond. All these components are what will help build not only a better city, but a just city. And none of this will be easy. There's two statements that come to mind that I think I think about the most. One is the one that's on my desk that John F. Kennedy said, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. I think this is the moment for our city that we have to try to change the narrative of those who are the haves and the have-nots in the city of Richmond. I believe one person can make that difference. I believe we must be bold in the face of challenge to change the institutions and conditions of life in our city that have kept Richmond bright future, shackled to the inequities and injustice of the past. Dr. King spoke about this when he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And what I love about St. Christopher's and also St. Catherine's is that you all get this. You get this. You understand the value of the power and relationships and community. You believe that everyone has both the capacity and responsibility to make a positive impact on the world. You care about character and integrity. You recognize that we are part of something greater than ourselves. And from St. Catherine's motto, what we keep, we lose, and only what we give remains our own. The responsibility to ending generational poverty in our city and taking our city to the next level is not a job of just one entity, government or mayor or anyone with a certificate of election. It's the responsibility of all its residents and all its people. And so my call to action for you all today is get involved beyond the classroom. The service that we need for all of our residents, for not only for you to just see it and talk about it on the internet, on social media, but to roll up your sleeves and get involved in making the impact that we want to see in our community. I thank you for this time, and I will be back. Thank you, guys. <laughs>
uh, with our guests. What is the best format here? Do we have selected questions, or is this just open for all? Okay, so just in case you couldn't hear, students, if you have a question, raise your hand. Mr. Green will acknowledge you. We ask students that you stand, please speak loudly and clearly so we can all hear uh, the question. So who's ready? No, no. What is Richmond's greatest asset? Richmond's greatest asset is, is, is young people. It's children. And if we don't recognize that and we don't pour everything we have in terms of the city and our community into our young people, then what kind of city are we going to be 20 or 30 years from now? And that's why I take the, uh, the initiative of investing in public education seriously. Because this is not about what our city's going to look like five years from now. It's about 20, 30 years from now. And can they live here long term? That's our greatest asset, talent, talented young people. Yes, that is true. And in the, in the context of the work that we do in our Office of Community Wealth Building, we want to make sure that all young people feel hopeful, that they have a belief that if they um, found the right pathway, there's a way to be successful in life. I have been, it's been sort of sad to see that there's so many folks in our community who don't think we care. In spite of all of our efforts with nonprofits, ministries, even lots of dialogue and committees, they, they feel that the doors are closed for them. So I think what young people can do to help encourage your, your um, people your same age is like the mayor mentioned, whether it's social media or having face-to-face -face interaction, I think that's key. Because we're all the same, but some people live in households where they don't have money to go on vacation. They don't have money to um, take advantage of activities, um, go to the museum or, or travel. And so to the extent that we can build these bridges where you all see yourselves as part of the future, that's how Richmond will succeed and that's our best asset. Thank you. Thank My position on the Confederate statues have never changed. When I ran for mayor in 2016, I said I wouldn't shed a tear if... I said I, I, said I would not shed a tear if uh, Jefferson Davis' statue would be removed. And I still stand by that today. What I did do, though, is expand the scope of our Monument Avenue Commission. At the beginning, I called for contextualization of those monuments, explain why they were put there, how they got there, what were the reasons behind them being there. And I expanded that after the, um, uh, after the, what we saw in Charlottesville, to now put removal on the table. So now we're going to have a robust discussion about the monuments of this city, um, because they are a relic of a vestige of Jim Crow, and we'll come to a resolution like other cities have as well. But we're not going to do that without a process in place. I respect the process, and we're going to have that robust discussion amongst all of Richmond. so many reasons why people find that they have barriers to uh, success. And from, in our context is how do we make sure that people have jobs that pay a living wage or at least jobs that pay enough money so that they can uh, function on their own or their families can thrive. There are some barriers that relate to mental health. And we have been intentional about inviting in the experts, people who day in, day out are involved with mental health issues in Richmond to find out what needs to be changed from a policy perspective or a structure perspective so that that barrier can come down. Often it's a matter of access. Uh, access and understanding that there are so many people in our community who are traumatized by their life situation. 
and there's lots has been written on it, lots has been lots of discussions and lectures about it. So we're trying to take all the facts that relate to mental health and use that to quantify how many people in our community find that that is the barrier, that's what's keeping them stuck. And what can we do as a community at the local level, the state level, dare to say the federal level, so that we have uh, opportunities for housing and employment and jobs uh, of all kinds for people who might face some mental health challenges. Um, how do you reconcile the access to racism that impacts a lot of patients that we've spoken about on the history of different people in different kinds of countries like that? And how do you, or what do you suggest that we can do um, in terms of how we can solve? Well, what I, um, <laughs> I think Richmond's a great city because of our rich history. At times it is complex, and sometimes it, it does hurt. And when you talk about history, unfortunately, sometimes it, it can be an indictment on things that may have happened in the past and reasons for uh, what occurs today. Uh, for me, though, I understand, and I think um, it's probably the uh, sentiment of a great amount of people who live in the city is that this is a different city than it was 100 years ago. And if we want to compete with other cities around this country and this world, I think we have to embrace that we're a different city than we were 100 years ago. And we must govern in a way, in a progressive way, around what makes us great. And that is that this is a welcoming and inclusive city. And once this is a destination for people who, who can feel like they can be whoever they are, no matter what barrier might be out there. Right here, in the boundaries of 60, point, 60 square miles, that's going to allow us to compete with anyone. I, I choose not to be a defeatist about, uh, oh, well, you know, 100 years ago this happened, and, or I've heard people before say, oh, 20 years ago this happened. Just because it happened and it, it didn't go too well, doesn't mean the future can't be even brighter. I don't wake up every day saying that, you know what, Richmond's an average city. I say we're the greatest city. And we're striving for excellence every day. In order to be excellent to me, means you have to be have an open and inclusive city, a culture that's open and inclusive as well. And guess what? That's why people are, are pouring into the city of Richmond. 22% of the people who live here now are between the ages of 20 and 29 years old. Half the city between the ages of 20 and 40 years old. This is a destination for millennials from all across the world because I think they feel not only they have a high quality of life, but they have a place that they can be welcomed and inclusive. Hope that answers your question. On, on this journey to be excellent, we also, uh, compassion is important. And, and I think we're at a time, and we can all work on this together, uh, when I mentioned before about moving away from charity to self-sufficiency, part of that means being in relationship with your neighbors, being in relationship with the people who live on the other side of town, uh, and vice versa, because the future Richmond means we will not have good neighborhoods and bad neighborhoods. We'll have, we'll be Richmond. And in order to get there, we need to uh, bring down the impression that everyone that you don't know is scary or different because you haven't really talked to them. And most people have some of the same wants and, and dreams. And I, I do feel that that's the energy that young people bring because you don't walk in the door with a lot of baggage. <laughs> and so just getting a chance to understand how to understand that com compassion will be what levitates us as a community. And to add to what uh, Mr. Gordon just said, I think Richmond is known for its generosity. I think if you look at the nonprofit community, the philanthropic community in this, this city, we are known for our generosity. And so how do we leverage the generous uh, people and entities in the city to ensure that everybody, everybody has a piece of the pie? That's what we should focus on. And so that means being a little bit more strategic than we have in the past. And as uh, Mr. Gordon said earlier, you know, just willy-nilly, just all of us creating nonprofits and you know, just saying, oh, we're doing our good, but how, are we, how can we in a strategic way make an impact? That's the, that should be the focus. One, one more question. Uh, what is the greatest challenge, the greatest challenge that the city of Richmond is facing right now? I, I think, uh, <laughs> 
Yeah. I think we would both agree that the, our greatest challenge in the city is generational poverty. Right? You've heard all, you can see, you read about the accolades of this great city anywhere. You know, second most attractive city for millennials and a top food town and a top you know, tourist destination. But when a quarter of your residents live under the poverty line, and that's just you know, uh, the, the statistical number, think about those who are also working poor in the city, you have created a, um, there's, there's a, a, a quality of the income gap between the people who live in the city. Folks who live in a certain part of the city live a very, very great quality of life. Some who live in another part of the city may say, not so much, because the schools they go to, they, con they consider to be poor, or the neighborhoods they live in, they consider to be unsafe. And so, if we fix generational poverty, you also fix those problems as well. And that is why every department that I have in this city is going to be focused on that mission alone. We end generational poverty, we reduce crime, we also get better performance out of our schools too. There is a, a Harvard Economic Opportunity Study that you can all research and find. Yes, we're on some great lists, but we're on that list and not in a good way. Richmond is at the 48th percentile, meaning for, for, for the possibility for economic upward mobility. That means there are only what, 2 percent of the places in the nation where you can uh, where, that have a worse situation. So that means that if you were born poor in Richmond, you will live in a poor neighborhood, you will grow up poor, you will die poor. And that even affects the, the, your lifespan and life expectancy. By contrast, Fairfax, Virginia, you know, there's, there's great upward economic mobility. So we're committed to, and that doesn't, that's, we can fix that. You know, that can be changed. We can move up that list. We don't want to be known as a place where if you're born in a certain situation, that's where you'll end up. Living. And the one thing, you know, we were uh, awarded the Culture and Health Prize by um, for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And it was one of those prizes where like, you know, it's not like we got the Heisman Trophy or anything like that. It was a, we are being innovative on how we tackle poverty in, in the city of Richmond. And the, uh, the head of the Robert Wood Foundation grabbed me after we were awarded the prize and said, you are going to be measured in the future on how long can a poor, African American born in an impoverished situation, can we, uh, can we elongate their life? Can we ensure that they live 20 years longer than they did when we received this prize? That's what we're going to be judged on. That our, our poorest residents, can they live 20 more extra years as those who may be living in other parts of our city? And that's something that we can change using every single lever of government, but we can't do it alone.